It's not just humans that want a place to call home. Animals have evolved countless ways of molding their world. Safe, secure hideaways. Constructing traps in which to catch prey. Building nests to protect their young. Animals have an instinct for architecture. And their achievements rival our greatest cities. We're surrounded by animal engineers. Humans pride themselves on being the most skilled builders in the animal kingdom. And we're ingenious when it comes to finding new ways of transforming our world. But the essence of architecture has changed little since the dawn of civilization. We start with a hole in the ground, and we end with a series of holes in the air, connected by walls, doors and windows. We've reached for the stars in our search for space, and it's resulted in the skyscrapers and tower blocks of modern cities, seemingly empty, sterile lands of concrete, brick, glass and steel. Ours are incredible structures. Surely no other creature can rival us. It's often said that the Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure visible from the moon, but it's not the only one made by life. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is clearly visible. Its engineers? Tiny coral polyps that build hard shells to protect their soft bodies from predators. Rolling hills of chalk are similarly formed from the skeletons of sea creatures. But just as man builds with wood, true animal engineers also use materials available in their surroundings. And they've become masters of their crafts. They're bricklayers, plasterers and weavers. They're burrowers and masters of origami. Some grow their own homes, while others simply squat in discarded lodgings. But animal engineering's not just about a place to live. Theirs is a world where sex hangs on the quality of interior design, where the mastery of tools makes the difference when hunting for a meal, where manipulating your materials gives your young a good start in life. And animal engineers aren't copying our construction methods. It's us that are mirroring them. On the African savanna, homes come in all shapes and sizes. Take the simplest mud hut. At every stage of the hut's assembly, you'll find parallels in the animal world. First, a hole is excavated, the foundations on which the hut will stand. The excavation skills of some insects can be just as impressive, only they've been doing it for much longer. Like all master builders, these Maasai tribesmen have learned how to best use the materials freely available in their surroundings. Tough, dried leaves securely bind their building's frame. In so doing, humans are mimicking nesting birds. The next stage of the hut's construction begins with the collection of mud, another versatile building material. These Australian mud dauber wasps use nothing else to build their homes. Again, it's us that are copying the animals. Soft and malleable when moist, mud can be moulded into virtually any shape. It will bake hard in the African sun and create an exceptionally strong home. But building with mud is laborious and time-consuming. It must be worked and shaped by hands to create the hut's outer walls. Such attention to detail guarantees a long-lasting shelter. The hut is now almost complete, and the last remaining struts of the wooden frame disappear below a layer of grass. This thatched roof will make the hut waterproof during the rainy season while insulating it against the scorching sun of summer. For many small animals, grass holds equally enticing building opportunities. Harvest mice build their snug homes from little else. It keeps them dry, and as the grass is still growing, it changes colour with the seasons. The final top knot of the hut's roof is more than a simple decoration. It holds the thatch in place and will prevent rain from seeping in. In less than a day, we can build a home that will last for years. 
But every one of our engineering principles has a version in the natural world. Only animals got there long before us. Some, like honeybees, even built cities. They raised their young in hexagonal cells. It's a space-saving design that inner-city architects have only recently begun to appreciate. Perhaps the most resourceful of all are the animals who gain a home by exploiting us. With more and more people across the world growing up in a man-made landscape, in a world where even the sight of a duck on an inner city pond can spark excitement, maybe setting aside a space for nature will benefit humans too. The simplest engineers in nature are those that find their homes ready-made. A discarded bottle provides all the accommodation needs of this blenny. It's a convenient bolt hole, where the fish can hide from predators and wait until food drifts by. It also provides a firm surface on which a community of tube worms can settle. They make the most of the architecture at hand. In contrast, a nearby whelk is the simplest of construction workers. It grows its own accommodation. Constructing an ornate shell around its soft body with material secreted by its shell gland. When it dies, the shell will be put to use by one of the world's first squatters. Hermit crabs survive by occupying the shells of marine snails, like whelks. It's a strategy that gives them protection throughout the world's oceans. This artificial glass shell allows us to see what's going on inside. The hermit crab's fourth and fifth pairs of legs are reduced in size so it can wedge its body inside even an ill-fitting shell. The crab's a fighter, good homes are hard to come by, so it will defend its shell aggressively. But despite their name, these hermits rarely travel alone. Most carry a constant companion in the shape of a bristle worm. Another squatter, bristle worms live within the crab's shell and feed on their food scraps. But crabs grow and shells don't, so hermits are on a constant lookout for a new home. The requirements of a new shell are not only that it should be larger, but also that it should be empty. But they're not averse to forcing out a rival when shells are in short supply. When a potential home is found, the hermit crab and the seemingly curious bristle worm carry out a thorough structural survey, making sure it's empty and sound. There's no point in moving into a damaged property. Next, the hermit checks to see if the shell is the right size. The crab measures the entrance with its oversized fighting claw. With everything up to scratch, the crab is now ready to move in. But this is a perilous time for the hermit crab. It's one of the rare times in its life when its soft body is unprotected and exposed to potential enemies. So it moves quickly, and the bristle worm follows close behind. It'll hide in the new shell until mealtime. Hermit crabs may not build their own shells, but they do subtly engineer their world for their own benefit. A great number of crabs carry sea anemones on their backs. The crab brushes it with its long antennae. It's a basic form of communication. The hermit crab demonstrating it has no intention of eating the anemone, while the anemone in return indicates it won't harm the crab. There seems to be something about the outer layer of a whelk shell when occupied by a hermit crab, which anemones find irresistible. Both animals are willing partners in this arrangement. The anemone's tentacles are packed with stinging nematocyst cells. Once 
Once it's moved onto the shell, they'll protect the crab from predators and aid its camouflage. This is the start of a lasting relationship. The crab is now armed with a plume of stinging tentacles and the anemone will benefit by being able to feed on scraps from the crab's table. With the tube worm, hermit crab, bristle worm and anemone, the discarded whelk shell is now home to a community of four. It's more like a village than a mobile home. On the beach, there's a simple but masterful builder. At low tide, extraordinary turrets stick up from the sand like miniature skyscrapers. These are the creations of the sand mason worm. The worm lives in the sand where it engineers a turret, through which it extends a crown of tentacles to sift the passing water for food. Within its tube, the sandworm is disguised and safe from predators. But that's not the extent of its building skills. The worm's home takes a battering from the tide. So at low tide, it ejects particles washed into the burrow and uses them to reconstruct its turret. It's a slow and seemingly haphazard process. But watch when it's speeded up. Once the turret is complete, the sand mason worm builds an ornate branching superstructure by sticking individual grains of sand together. This is not just a home. It's a building designed to withstand the waves, provide a safe home from predators, and increase the reach of the worm's filtering tentacles. In freshwater, a simple and no less effective shelter is built by the larvae of the caddis fly. But this will be a mobile home. It might seem a little awkward walking around in a case of cut up weed, but it's a vital means of survival for the larva, camouflaging it until it becomes an adult fly. Other caddisfly larvae begin their life in fast-flowing streams. The currents can be ferocious, so the larvae must build heavier homes of rock. They're also streamlined to prevent them being washed away. Expert stonemasons, these animal engineers sort through the gravel in search of just the right sized stones to use next. The larvae continually add to the case to make more room as they grow. Each species builds in its own unique way. One always adds a long twig to its case. Another builds exclusively with the shells of freshwater snails, presumably as a lightweight, camouflaged home. It's the definition of animal engineering 
changing your surroundings to suit your own specific needs to produce a home or camouflage hideaway. In Australia, there are several families of moth whose larvae also build camouflage structures from the surrounding materials. They're called case moths or bagworms. Just like the caddisflies, these cases vary in their design, but all are elegant and symmetrical. But whatever their look, case moths are extraordinary architects. Animals can be remarkable builders. Prepare to meet an insect that applies all the basic principles of engineering to fashion a secure home by doing nothing more than rolling a leaf. It's the closest animals have come to mastering origami. In the woodlands of Northern Europe can be found the leaf-rolling weevil. In the summer months, the female weevil selects a leaf that she'll painstakingly fold and cut into a cigar-shaped cone that will eventually house her egg. We rarely get the chance to see her at work. The first thing she does is make a cut in the stalk end of the leaf. Then she folds the leaf in half along its central vein. She bites the vein solidly and methodically to weaken it for the next stage of the operation. The weevil has hooks and pads on its feet and spines on its ankles to help it grip as it works. Its oversized mouth is perfectly designed for cutting and manipulation of the leaf. Biting and folding is difficult for the beetle. After all, the leaf is designed to stay rigid and horizontal to maximise its exposure to the sun. It's also much bigger than the insect. Considering the relative size of the beetle and the leaf, this is a gargantuan feat of engineering. The weevil's persistence pays off. Once the central vein has been bitten along its length, the leaf becomes more flexible and can be gradually folded in half. The weevil takes engineering to a new level of expertise, changing the physical characteristics of its building material and creating a home from a leaf that is still alive and growing on the tree. Instinctively, it knows which part of the leaf to fold and in which order the folds must be made. There's a strict schedule of construction that the insect must adhere to if its work is to succeed. This involves a degree of foresight on the part of the insect. When the first roll is secure, she bites a hole through the canopy to receive her egg. This is the tiny treasure that justifies all the beetle's efforts, and it must be deposited early on, so that when the leaf is completed, it will be entirely encased. The beetle tucks the edges in carefully to ensure the egg won't fall out. This isn't just a nest, but a ready supply of food for her grub when it hatches from the egg. 
Now all the beetle has to do is roll up the rest of the leaf. She tucks in the sides and there's no need for glue. The structure is held fast by making use of the properties of the leaf itself. The work gets harder as the rolled leaf gets fatter and fatter. And after several hours of continuous effort, the end is in sight. And now we can see why it was so important for the weevil to make its initial cut into the stem. The stalk end of the leaf now provides an umbrella to keep the whole cigar shape safe and dry. As with so much in the animal construction world, the process is easier to see speeded up. All weevils go to great lengths to provide a safe home for their eggs. But the acorn weevil isn't an expert at origami. Instead, it drills a hole into an acorn as it ripens on an oak tree. She'll lay just one egg inside, using her telescopic ovipositor to reach deep into the seed. Before she leaves, she'll close off the tunnel, securing her egg from parasites and disease. Come autumn, the acorn drops to the ground. will never germinate into a new tree, as the now mature weevil larva gnaws its way out of the empty husk. The larva will burrow into the soil to pupate, and emerge next year to lay eggs of its own. Australia can be found a curious spider. It's nocturnal, coming out at night to feed on prey caught in its net by day. This is also the time for it to construct a home. Eucalyptus leaves curl as they dry. It's a property the spider exploits. The spider sleeps during the day. The leaf will be used to protect it from birds and parasitic wasps. First, she weaves a silk harness around a selected leaf. The spider already has a web among the trees above. The leaf will form a shelter beside it. She'll lay her eggs in another leaf, hung in foliage away from her web. This stage is all about getting the positioning of the silk strands exactly right. A few small adjustments are made and the leaf is hoisted into position. Silk shrinks as it leaves the spider's body. And if she gets her calculations right, this shrinkage helps curl the leaf around to make the perfect tent. The bottom of the leaf remains open to allow her access. In contrast, the leaf used to protect the eggs will be entirely enclosed in silk for added security. 
By making the most of leaves, her building material, and silk, her mortar, the leaf curling spider has become a supreme animal engineer. Generally, when you think of spiders, you think of the webs they weave. Orb webs make highly successful traps, and they're so strong, they're even used as fishing nets by the people of New Guinea. The web is invisible to insects, and once they hit it, glue ensnares them. Finer than hair, tougher than steel, and more elastic than nylon, silk is probably the most versatile building material used by animals. The black widow spider builds sheets of silk over glue-covered tripwires. Even prey as large as this scorpion finds it hard to escape. The Australian net casting spider engineers a latticework of silk to throw over its prey. The bolas spider makes a lasso with a sticky ball at the end. The ball is covered with the same scent as that of a female moth which lures male moths to their death. Trapdoor spiders use their silk to make lairs underground, from which to lunge at passing prey. Silk is such a versatile material that some spiders even use it to construct underwater homes like diving bells. By manipulating silk, spiders can survive almost anywhere and by any means. They're at the cutting edge of animal engineering, In the dry African savanna lives another creature whose skill as an engineer is used in the pursuit of prey. It's not strictly a builder, but a burrower, and it's not digging a home, but a trap. The trap's success depends entirely on the animal's ability to apply sound engineering principles. The animal in question is the ant lion. Before it reaches maturity and flies away, the larva of the antlion preys on one of Africa's most abundant food sources. The secret of how the pitfall trap works is its conical shape. First, the tiny larva must clear the area of relatively large stones. It's an expert excavator. Its strong neck and powerful jaws catapult rocks away from the building site. Larger pieces of gravel, too heavy to catapult, are heaved up the slope backwards. When it's cleared the ground, it begins to excavate the pit, pushing soil backwards in ever-deepening spirals. The angle of the pit wall is the steepest at which sand remains stable. It's called the angle of lapse, and it's the reason why sand dunes form their characteristic cone shape. Anything added to the surface, prey for example, will cause an avalanche until the sand returns to its secure angle. An unsuspecting ant walks right into the trap. The slope is too steep for it to climb out. Its chances of escape are minimal. The ant lion flicks sand at the ant to enhance the avalanche effect. Because the pit is formed from the inside outwards, every grain of sand thrown out slips back until the slope has returned to the angle of lapse. Despite its frantic attempts to scale the walls, the ant can't get free, and once the ant lion has a firm grip on its prey, the end is near. It's slowly dragged beneath the surface to be eaten. Ants offer a rich supply of protein, perfect for the growing larva, whose appetite is relentless. Having sucked the ant's body dry, the larva brings it back to the surface and catapults the empty husk away. A few adjustments to the deadly slope and the trap is ready once more. 
The antlion buries itself and waits, jaws ajar, for its next victim. These must be amongst the most well-known animal engineers. Meet the avian construction crew. Every home is built in a secure location where they can nurture and protect their young. But there is as great a variation in nest design as there is in the diversity of birds that make them. One of Africa's master builders constructs an impressive home. Of all the materials on the savannah, grass is the most abundant and dozens of species of weaver bird use it in an ingenious way. Unlike most birds, it's the male weaver that's in charge of nest building. It's mastered the art of knot tying to a degree that would make any sailor green with envy. Firstly, the weaver knots a hoop of grass under a branch. With the hoop in place, the bird will build its nest around it. By hanging the nest in mid-air, the weaver allows the wind to keep it cool, while keeping its chicks out of reach of most predators. Getting the thatch right is very important. The nest must be strong, and two or three layers of grass will make excellent insulation against the scorching sun. It's no surprise that females select their mates according to the quality of the nest they build. It's likely that male bowerbirds also once attracted a mate by the quality of the nest they could build. After all, they're not much to look at. But what the bowerbird lacks in sartorial elegance, it makes up for in engineering excellence. In the forests of Australia and New Guinea, male bowerbirds use dried grass to construct a stage, an arena on which to display for a mate. There are several species of bowerbird, and each prepares an arena in its own way. The spotted bowerbird is a so-called avenue builder, constructing a long two-sided bower of tall grass. He'll spend nine or ten months building and maintaining his bower before the female even shows up. Males and females live quite separate lives. With keen attention to detail, the male dedicates his time to repairing the walls of his arena and getting everything just right. Accessories are also important. The general rule of thumb is, the brighter the better, but different species prefer different looks. A bowerbird living beside a road will use broken glass and ring pulls to adorn his site. The bird shifts the treasure around as if it's on exhibit, and that's exactly what it is. If the female's suitably impressed, she'll mate with him, before leaving to build a nest and raise her chicks alone. And the male will return to tending his bower and attracting another mate. The harvest mouse builds its nest in fields of wheat, where it makes use of a particular characteristic of grass. Grasses have parallel veins in the leaves, which mean they can be split along their length with great accuracy. The pregnant female shreds lengths of grass while they're still attached to the stems and weaves them together. 
by pulling loops from one split leaf through another, she gradually builds up a tough woven structure. And because the leaves are still attached to their veins, her nest is as alive and green as the surrounding field. The bottom of the nest is pulled up and knitted in to make a secure floor. The result is a sound and solid little basket, perfectly hidden amongst the wheat. Like most animal architecture, it's a process that's easier to follow when the action is speeded up. The final nest shows an appreciation of engineering on a par with human builders. is still alive, it will change colour as the wheat ripens, and the nest will remain camouflaged throughout the year. Mice aren't the only ones to engineer their homes from leaves. Weaver ants glue leaves together using a silky substance produced from their own larvae. Worker ants carry the larvae to the construction site, where they're lightly squeezed between the ants' mouth parts. This coaxes them to release silk, which is woven back and forth. It's like using a sewing needle. If an ant can't reach the next leaf, the ants link their bodies together to form a chain to slowly pull the leaves tight for sewing. Many ants, like these army ants from South America, use their own bodies in the construction process. Indeed, army ants often form temporary cities from nothing else. It's all about protecting the queen and the grubs inside. By working together as a team, ants build nests much larger than any individual could hope to achieve. The nest can be half a metre long and is perfectly camouflaged against the foliage. But eventually the colony is built up into a vast insect city. And just like human towns and cities, each colony will have more nests nearby, linked by a system of walkways. It's an insect road network. For humans, building is a time-consuming, laborious business. We start with a hole in the ground, and we end with a series of holes in the air connected by walls, doors and windows. Along the way, we use all the technical skills we've seen mirrored in the activities of the master builders of the animal world. But for some animals, our prolific building activities have opened new avenues they can exploit. The house martin gets its name from its habit of building nests of mud and grass under the eaves and roofs of our houses. so many houses about, the house martin lived very much like its cousin, the sand martin, digging simple holes into sandy cliffs in which to nest. and wasps are renowned for building elaborate nests. In Australia, no fewer than four separate families of wasps have evolved the same technique to manipulate mud for their nest. Provided there's enough water about, mud in a hot climate has at least two advantages. It can be moulded into any shape and it dries quickly.
The wasp builds groups of cells in which she lays her eggs. At first, the walls are soft and flexible, but they soon dry in the warm tropical breeze. Smoothing out the inside is an important finishing touch to ensure there are no gaps. The finished cell is porous, but completely enclosed. Inside, her eggs will not only be kept out of the reach of predators, but will be cool and moist too. When each cell's finished, she'll stock it with spiders that she's paralyzed with her sting and lay an egg beside them. When the egg hatches, the grub will feed on the spiders. Capping the cell is the most difficult part of the job, but the wasp has a trick to make the work much easier. She collects mud in the normal way, but makes sure that it's very wet. She also takes water into her crop. Once she has the mud in position near the entrance of the cell, she makes it runny by working it with her jaws and by adding water from her crop. It's important that the cell is quickly and properly sealed to protect the egg and its food store. A second lid is laid on top of the first to complete the fortress. She'll never see her young. By the time they hatch, she'll be long dead. Mud dauber wasps go to extreme lengths to ensure that their nest is secure and hidden. They even daub sausages of mud onto the outside to serve as dummy cells and confuse potential predators. The female wasp has invested a monumental amount of time and energy in ensuring her eggs will survive. The extraordinary parental care shown by these wasps hints at a long evolutionary history of predation and parasitism by other insects. and wasps are renowned for building nests of a beauty and complexity that rival our own constructions. But how did they evolve from solitary creatures like mud daubers to social animals capable of building insect cities? The mason bee nests in wood piles. Several eggs will be stored with a supply of pollen for food before being sealed up behind a wall of mud, just like the mud dauber wasp. supply of pollen and nectar and sealed behind a wall of leaves. In America, leafcutter bees have been imported to live in vast artificial cities from where they pollinate fields of alfalfa. 
solitary bees hint at the origins of social insects. Bumblebee society begins with the queen building a cell of wax and pollen, a home and food for her eggs. Once hatched, her young take over, leaving the queen to the sole role of breeding. It's the same in wasp society. The queen builds the nest from which her city will grow. Like wasps, these hornets build hexagonal paper nests from chewed wood. The hexagon shape is an incredibly efficient way of using space, something that human engineers are just beginning to appreciate. But like solitary bees, wasp and hornet societies must be rebuilt each year. The master insect builders have even conquered this problem. By stocking their hexagonal homes with honey, wax and pollen, Honeybees are assured a supply of food year-round. A healthy hive can contain 50,000 bees, and most will survive the winter. A queen like this can live for six years, and when she dies, her colony will live on with a new queen. This is the closest animals have come to evolving cities like our own. Skyscrapers dominate our mega-cities. And we've turned the world into a seemingly empty, barren land. But even here, wildlife can thrive. For some, man's prolific building activities offer new opportunities. And by setting aside a little space for nature, surely we can benefit too. have reached for the sky with their architecture. But even skyscrapers are based on engineering principles used by animals since long before we came on the scene. The materials may change, but the techniques are the same. Hermit crabs and blennies are squatters. Sand mason worms and caddisflies bricklayers. Harvest mice and weaver birds work knitting patterns. Leaf-rolling weevils and spiders practice origami. One thing unites them all. They're tailoring their world to fit their needs. Spiders and antlions build traps. Birds build nests and arenas for their mates. And case moths build elaborately camouflaged homes. For some, life's no longer a solitary affair. Whole communities can be built around the shell of a whelk. While ants build cities with their own bodies, or use their grubs to cement the walls of their homes. But the masters of engineering are those that live social lives. A healthy beehive can survive for years and several generations. Wasps and hornets build cities of pollen and paper that surpass even our own structures of glass and steel. It's the closest animals have come to evolving cities of their own. Surely these are the ultimate animal engineers.